So now that everyone is aware and conscientious of the fact that you're being recorded, everyone is now being recorded. Public service announcement. No, the way we always do... Have you ever listened to the show, Aldo? I have, yeah, a few times. Okay, cool. The format is almost always we just want to, like, know a simple description of who you are, where you work, what you do. For you, it's there is no simple description, so good luck with that one. And then you have just how you got into coding. Like, I want to know, like, what was the very first time you ever wrote a single line of code? I have no idea what that story is, Now I find that very interesting to know. And then we can kind of go up to the present, and then we'll get into this huge chunk of topics you want to talk about. And there'll be a couple of terms I'll want you to define, like mono repo and mega repo and, and stuff like that. That'll be kind of how we'll get into it. And then once we get into the flow, it'll just go. My first line of code. Oh, so first, I'm Aldo. That's my name. <laughs> and that's all you need to know, actually. Now we're, we're going to fill in the, the blanks. You know how I learned to code? I learned to code by clicking on view source on Internet Explorer back in like 1996, 1997. I had internet like everyone else and I found it fascinating and I realized that I could look at the code. So I pretty much taught myself to code. That was the track. And then I kept learning on my own and I took a very non-traditional path. I guess. But one of the advantages of having had to learn on my own, especially at a time where it was hard to come by information, because right now you have all these online classes, which would have been great, you know, for in the beginning, I, it was very inefficient to learn to kind of piece it all together on my own. But one of the advantages of doing it that way is that I still learn with the same strategies, basically, I, I developed like a, a way of approaching new problems. And I think that that was the defining feature or characteristic of my career, you know, like that, that kind of attitude, even though there's nothing out there that I can use as a, an educational resource for something, I can actually just go and look at the thing itself and tear it apart and, and learn. And so that led me down a very long path, which I, I don't think it's very interesting. We don't have infinite time, so I'll skip through that. But I ended up working uh, on re research, doing research, uh, w which is basically mo more of that. When you do research for, for companies, for companies that are actually building real products, what you're trying to do is you want to look into the future, try to understand things before everybody else understands them, because otherwise, you know, it, it doesn't give you any advantage. But at the same time, you have to carry a team with you. You have to lead the, the way and, and you can't really run too far off that nobody nobody can follow. So my, my career has been basically learning to, to balance those two things. And I love it, man. I mean, it's not a career as much as it is a compulsion. <laughs> it's good to hear that research is still a career that can be done today. Because I've had this conversation with some people that you have things like Bell Labs. Bell Labs was really famous for having a research lab that invented things like the transistor and all this ridiculous stuff. And there's not as many concentrated areas that are producing lots and lots of really in-depth research, but there's kind of pockets of it in lots and lots of different niches, it seems like to me. So when you say you're doing research, research into what specifically? If I asked you, like, what is research? You would probably say universities have postdocs doing research and you have institutions that have labs like Nokia Bell Labs, Oracle Labs, and so on. Like these guys have labs. But if you look inside those labs, you also find postdocs doing research. Like, And that type of research is usually done by uh, someone who is very specialized, who has accumulated an insane amount of knowledge on a very specific topic. They're very aware of where they are in the bigger picture. They know that they're focusing on something specific. They know what kind of problem they are trying to break. If you look at the people that do programming language research, it's pretty clear what the edges of that is now. You have like um, a cluster of people that are trying to push those limits. The same with database technology or or AI at this time. Even though research sounds like a very vague thing, it's actually very concrete in that sense. So what I like to do is something else, something more complementary, where I try to be more general and I try to do the work that comes before going deep. I can go deep and I can relate and I can communicate well with people that are highly specialized, but I like to build a bridge between reality and the technology and an application. So in that sense, it's more freeform what I do. And that's why, you know, I work mostly with startups. I like taking problems that are not well defined, where people have an intuition that maybe there's something there. And then I go through this phase of obsession and just consuming all possible information. And I eventually 
regurgitate something that makes sense and then build a prototype and all, and in the process i also find the right people so now we're ready to go deep one of the big things you're saying and it's so hard in the normal life is we're all developers we get busy with working with jobs we see something cool you're saying you like to really research that thing that's really cool and then go as deep as you can know every little nook and cranny you can and really enjoy your time with it exactly yeah. now when you think about what people consider cool these days we we are actually in a moment in history where it's very easy to get distracted and jump in this sort of hamster wheel where we're always searching for the next cool thing and week after week like we we shift our focus to something that is not necessarily driven by any understanding of the significance of the thing but more it's more of a, a, a marketing or like a social reaction right like people are talking about this must be cool so another important aspect here is to be able to have your own framework to assign importance to the things that that happen otherwise you get easily distracted so that, that's another thing that I, I i try to take a step back and understand the fundamentals so that i can tell even though everybody might be regurgitating or kind of um, rehashing the, the same information and saying, hey, this is really cool. This is where the future is going. I try to have my own opinion based on sort of a logical understanding. So do you see yourself as a contrarian? Well, I see myself as a realist. <laughs> and I think I always try to have a, a reason why behind my, my opinion. Like I, I, I can go back. And it's becoming increasingly important. We've had a lot of discussions lately, right? Around all these tools, they appear and I'm, I'm the one complaining. But what I'm trying to do is to remind people that you need to be able to explain why something is truly novel and will have an impact, not just because everybody is, is, is thinking that way. Another thing that I've been coding since I was 15, so and I'm 40 now, so I've been doing this for a long time. And after, you know, learning eight programming languages and building a few compilers and then building databases and so on, like you accumulate some set, a, a set of knowledge. And after some point, everything is more of the same. For me, it's not that costly at this time to go deep on things because I see patterns mostly. Yeah, you see the larger structures. Yeah, and I think computer science isn't really that deep, you know, like medicine is huge. It's a very vast universe, ever expanding frontier, right? It's impossible for a doctor to say, I think I know pretty much everything. But in computer science, you can. If you leave aside AI and you leave aside like the more statistical, non-deterministic kind of branches, if you just talk about programming languages and processors and storage and all that, it's a pretty finite universe. It all goes down to ones and zeros at the end of the day in its final form. And quantum computers are going to change the yeah. <laughs> It's still ones and zeros though, but it's ones and zeros in different middle and deterministic states. So right. still ones and zeros. <laughs> One thing that's something that stuck with me, someone said, when it comes to UI, it's just like the fashion industry, but software developers don't want to say it. I agree. Absolutely. Why are we redesigning our UIs every year? The new trend. And then we go back on ourselves five years later with the old trend. It's just bonkers half the time because you're not, you're no longer in fashion. While we're on the subject of UIs, I really want to dive into two specific areas where you seem to have vast knowledge. And that is CLIs and dev tools. You've been building and experimenting with a dev tool for Redwood. I would love to get deeper into it. Let's do it. Let's approach this from the top. One of the hardest things these days is to be able to communicate clearly, especially in this environment where there's a lot of noise and, and everybody's voice is very loud. My voice is not loud. I quit social media in 2013. So I've had trouble like finding a megaphone. I was going to say, you're going to be the only person on the show that I'm not even going to bother linking to your Twitter in the show notes because your last tweet was in 2014. Yeah, and it was something like, hey, I'm back <laughs> after a long absence. And I actually, I don't find the motivation. Not Now that I have the startup and I have so something to say, things are going to change. So for the last two years, I've been noticing that things are getting worse in general for developers. They're getting really, really hard. Four years ago, it wasn't common to spend 50% of your time fighting with build tools or configuration or even talking about build tools. Like you would just start a project, set it up somehow, and then it will be all about the features. But today, it's almost like there's no time to talk about the actual features. It's all about the technology. It's all about the compiler that you're using or the framework or the conversation completely shifted towards the meta issues. And, and I've been trying to think, is there some sort of common denominator, like an underlying trend that is driving this? 
because from the surface, it looks very complex. Like when you try to approach this problem, what you find is you find pockets of issues. You find issues with build tools, you find issues with configuration, issues with compatibility between things, dependency management. It seems like it's a constellation of problems and there's no common denominator here. But it turns out that there is something under all of this. It took me two years to start seeing it clearly, but once I put a label on it, this was like a, maybe a, a month ago or so when I started talking about this. I've seen people's reaction and, and it's pretty cool. So I hope your reaction is going to be cool as well. So what I think is going on right now is that we are going through a phase of hyper complexity. We have a, an epidemic of complexity that is taking over our lives in general, but more specifically in technology. What I mean by hyper complexity is that the complexity of any project, any code base, anything that we're dealing with is way higher than what we can manage easily, like as a human, as a developer. We have a limit. As humans, we can only remember a certain amount of words. We tend to think of ourselves as machines and that we are infinitely scalable, but we're actually not. We're just a bag of meat. This is actually a really good experiment that I ran when I was in AP Psych that they would do. They would give you basically a list of words that they would flash in front of you. And they would say, like, remember as many of them as you can. And they would flash like 20 words in front of you. And then you'd have to say back however many words you can remember. And almost everyone would cap out somewhere between six and eight. There's an actual specific number limit that your brain, your short-term memory could hold in its head. Yes, that's absolutely right. And that's the problem. We actually do have a limit when it comes to managing complexity, to managing the number of tools, the number of packages that you have. There are different concepts and the quantity of these concepts is too high and not just the quantity but the relationship between things that you put in a code base they grow exponentially the number of relationships grows exponentially because th there is a network effect if you have typescript things are fine then you add i don't know webpack okay still fine but there's an interaction between these two add a testing framework now there's an interaction between these three things and now you need to add coverage and add this and add that and each of these tools or each of these requirements that you add they talk to each other so you have an exponential growth. And that means that at some point, you reach a tipping point where this thing just explodes. It's the nature of exponential growth. What we're really dealing with, the essence of the, the matter is that there's an explosion in complexity. Why is this happening? Why, why are we seeing this now and not 10 years ago? There are a few trends that are driving this. So one of them is the movement to full stack development, where you expect one team, one developer to actually take care of all of the different layers of an application. So that means that in this unit, this project, now you throw in more things than you used to throw in before. Then you have microservices. Microservices, they kind of embrace the idea of splitting things into manageable, independently evolvable services and things. But how you connect these together, how you, how you make the machinery for this work adds complexity. Now you have three different projects with five different build tools because of microservices, right? Then you have monorepos on top of this. So now it's okay to make your repo grow infinitely. It's not frowned upon. That's the whole point is bring everything into the same repo. And there are more trends, but these are like, I think the major ones. Now, if you look at why we are following these trends, they will give us something, right? So monorepos, they remove all the overhead in collaboration. Now you don't have to think about where to go to file an issue for X. It's all in the same place. So you have the collaboration benefits, the removing the overhead in monorepos. Microservices, you have decoupling, independent evolvability, the scalability that you get. Microservices and serverless are kind of related in that sense. Then you have full stack, which will evidently you have more leverage if you use a framework that helps you know deal with every layer. We're chasing these benefits, but in the process of doing that, we're incurring in hyper complexity. Now, a few years ago, if you looked at all the code base in the world, you would still find hyper complex code bases but they would only happen rarely. So you would have the likes of Google, right? That they would have a hyper complex code base, but it took them years to get to that level. They had time to adapt. They had time to build mechanisms and processes and tools to manage this complexity. You had Facebook, you have some big financial institutions. So it's not a new thing. What's new is that now everybody and their dog has a hyper complex code base and we are not Google and we haven't had that much time. And the tools we're using are the same tools we were using for this previous reality. That's kind of the, the problem statement. Uh, b before I continue, I'd like to, uh, do you guys have any comments or feedback on this? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> one of the hardest things I find about this is when you're a single developer, say you've worked in a company or you've not, or you're at different stages or you're not, you tend to 
clutch to your previous experiences to say what to do next, how to set up a new project, how to go about the internet as a developer. And it's the thing of when someone says to you, haven't you tried a mono repo? You go, why would I want a mono repo? And blah, blah, blah. They tell you everything. You go, okay, you go away, you implement it. It seems in that second, I've made a good choice. I've made a right choice. But how do you truly know you've made a right choice or a wrong choice? And I've seen this with Everfun to a certain extent. We start bridging multiple projects quite easily. A WordPress plugin in PHP, API in Redwood, a website in Next. I made the the mistake of putting it all in one mono repo. And I can say that hand on my heart, it was a mistake. Why? Because Yarn Workspace has just chained everything together, making NPM modules incompatible between Next.js and PostCSS. And it just added so much more complexity. For what? What was the reason? I could just put my Git issues in one repository? Did that seem worth it? And then the second thing to that was the money you were spending on what? For example, if you have three websites on Netlify or Vercel in one mono repo and you push an update to one of them, well, Vercel and Netlify is going to rebuild three websites because it's all in the same Git repository. When you stop and think, what was the reasons for using a mono repo? I still don't think I can really say them in practice as in, yeah, all my code's in one place, but does it need to be if you know what I'm saying it's a real hard one and obviously that is complexity at scale you know when we've had developers join us at Everfund it's been this thing of okay this tiny part of this pie is what you're working on just ignore everything else and let's not even get started with git sub modules and all that kind of stuff it goes on for days doesn't it as you're saying complexities and we're like why are we making these complexities for ourselves we're building a cage at the end of the day you know, I hear you talking about this and I see the struggle, like trying to find the local maximum, trying to think long term, sifting through all the new projects, trying to keep it all in your head. The liberating insight for me, which was really like an aha moment, was when I realized none of this matters. It's just more of the same. Like you, you are describing your problem right now from the perspective from where you're seeing this. Tomorrow you're going to have another issue. And if I ask Anthony or I ask somebody else, they are all going to have their own little set of problems that are trying to solve. But the underlying cause of all this is that there has been a complexity explosion and we haven't acknowledged it from a systematic point of view. And this is not a, a, an abstract exercise. So actually there are solutions to this. You know, you, you, you were talking about tools and that's a great segue for like the, the next part. So we talk about the, the problem, right? We're trying to agree on some terminology here. Let's just play this game for a while. So we have hyper complexity building up in our code bases because there are some trends that are driving this and it's spreading like wildfire. So what are we doing about this now? What we're doing about this right now is that we are focusing on solving the symptoms. We don't see complexity directly. We experience the side effects of complexity. Things start breaking down and they start breaking down in a million different ways, which is what makes it even harder. But if you start enumerating these ways, right, there are some that are very common. Build speeds are terrible. Dependency conflicts. The CI workflows are complicated. Pushing a release involves so many moving pieces. We have a list, of, a long list of things. And for the last two years or so, we've seen people complaining about these things in increasing numbers. And this has driven investment in this area. So you have tech savvy VC funds that are looking into this and seeing they're recognizing a pattern, like something's going on here. People are complaining a lot. And then you have startups that are managing to get huge initial traction just by focusing on each of these individual issues, right? So you have a, a whole new generation of projects that are promising to rewrite the tool chain to make it faster and so on. But they are just going after the individual side effects. Will this succeed? Is this a good thing? If all of these startups succeed, will we get out of the, the problem? Unfortunately, I don't think so, because we know already that if you treat the symptoms of any disease and you just treat the symptoms, you don't really get out of the underlying problem. It gives you a relief, a momentary kind of moment of bliss, but eventually another symptom will appear. So in the long run, it's a losing game, right? It's a losing strategy. You need to focus on the underlying cause. And I don't think that anybody has framed it this way because it seems so confusing. But what, once you start looking at it from this perspective, then you can ask yourself another question. And the, and the question is, how can we prevent complexity from building up in the first place? It's like cholesterol. Like you can go and get a, you know, a bypass or a, some sort of surgery to clear your, your arteries. But 
it would be much better if you had prevented that from building up in the first place. That is the, the, the guiding question behind what we're doing is how can we prevent complexity from building up? Because if we prevent complexity from building up, all of these problems go away. And here's a little mental exercise, if you don't believe me. If you get your code base and you throw away everything and you just keep like five lines of code, one build tool, one way of making tests, you don't need to worry about tooling anymore. It's unrealistic. If you do that, you're going to lose all your features. But the point is, if you shrink things to a manageable state, you don't need any of these other tools. These other tools are just patching the issue. This is a really interesting idea, and I'd like to hone in on this for a second, because this is very similar to how I approach tutorials in that when I want to create a tutorial for something, I want to create an end-to-end -end experience where you start from zero, build something from scratch, and then get to some sort of end state. So the question is like that end state for me is usually a thing deployed to the internet that someone else can hit with a URL. You create an end-to-end -end experience of how do you create that? What are the steps involved with that? What steps with the CLI? What code do you write? What language is that in? And then you can get a self-contained experience of what is actually building a thing with this like. And then you can look at, okay, if I needed to extend this to XYZ use case, what would I need to add on? Are those things provided? Are they not? that gives you like a baseline to think about that is like you say, manageable and can be contained within like a single article. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our job as developers, we are all monkeys. I'm a monkey, you're a monkey. And some of us have more time to focus on, on solving these issues and others are just struggling with family and work and a lot of things. Our job as the monkeys with more time to build tools for the other monkeys <laughs> is to try and make them simple, is to understand what you can throw away, what you can keep so that they don't have to invest time, valuable time, trying to figure that part out. And making things simple is the hardest thing to do because in order to make something simple, you need to know everything about everything related to that. You need to know exactly what you can throw away because you know the consequences. So this quest for simplicity is our mission. Like this is what, what we should do as tooling developers, as framework developers. It's a big responsibility because then you get millions of people that are using whatever you build. And if you were lazy in doing this and you were careless, and you didn't squeeze as much simplicity as, as you could into this, you're gonna cost them time, right? You're costing people time. It's like sending someone to jail <laughs> in a way. <laughs> it's like, as a tooling developer, you can be responsible for thousands of hours of people just banging their head against the wall. It's like a lot of power. I've been workshopping this into like sort of a coherent story. I'll try to rush to the end so that you guys see how, how it all connects. So we're talking about the solutions right now. People are building tools and we are kind of seeing this gold rush. My projection is that none of this is going to, to work. These companies are going to make money, but Herbalife made a lot of money. Vitamin supplement companies make money, but they don't necessarily solve the problem. They just prey on people's pain and confusion, right? I'm not saying they're evil. I'm just saying it's more of a temporary relief. But there is a side effect to this that we need to be aware of. It's very easy to get stuck in a hamster wheel of trying new tools, evaluating them, getting some benefit from this. And then a week later, you, you go through the same process. You get like this quick wins, small sprouts of happiness because, oh, my filters are so fast. Yeah, you commit, everybody applauds you. Then next week, the same. And, and this starts building a habit over time because there is this micro reward kind of cycle. You start reinforcing this idea that searching for tools and rewriting and all that is actually a good thing and it isn't that is unnecessary work and i see that we are like going head first into this and you have the perverse incentive of tooling startups to try and sell you this idea that's what they're counting on like hey have you tried my new build system it does distributed caching it's better than this one because of x and you're like oh yeah yeah, yeah. that's gonna save us right next week you change the testing framework it breaks because of course it can't cover everything and you have to move again and so on. So I'd like to, to try and l label that idea as well. For now, I'm settling on the notion of tooling addiction or tooling dependence, because it has exactly the same structure as an addiction. It's funny when you look at how it takes over teams, they become addicted to tooling and now you can't really talk to them anymore. because They, they just want that next fix. They need the next fix. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. They're, they're looking at Twitter, they're trying new things, but that's not going to work. So what, what is going to work? We've talked about what the problem, we've talked about what doesn't work. So what does work? Well, the answer is not simple, but, but it exists. And we can try to understand kind of what the general strategy is. So we already know about a certain set of characteristics that are really good at fighting complexity. So we already know that, for example, encapsulation, layering, composability, high level abstractions, leverage, these are things that if a programming language has many of them, these languages tend to be better at 
dealing with complexity at scaling. They let you do more without hitting this exponential kind of runaway point where you just lose control of everything. So the question then becomes, how can we take the technologies that we have now and use some of these basic principles, like retrofit these basic principles into the technologies that we use now, because we don't want to tell people that they have to change everything and learn a new programming language. That's not going to work. We need to do it with the technologies that we have right now. So we need to retrofit them and add more of these characteristics. And that's what I've been working on for the last two years, taking, in this case, TypeScript and JavaScript and rethinking from a very fundamental level how we can retrofit these magical things that we've seen work in other places. This is not about discovering something totally new. It's about bringing things that we know work into the mainstream, into the tools that we use. So because this approach is generic experimentation in a way, because we're taking genes from other species, right? And we are like splicing them into JavaScript and TypeScript. That's where the like the, the name of the project came, the Lamp Dragon, which I think is pretty funny how it all like starting to make sense now, right? The Lamp Dragon is a little lamp with some dragon DNA and it spits fire and it has wings. So it's a very good analogy to what we we're trying to do for JavaScript and TypeScript. We're trying to make it spit fire so that you can kill complexity. And it actually works. Like we, we've managed to take uh, huge monorepo code bases and slash the size without losing any features at all, slash it in half, just because we tweak the language ever so slightly so that now you can have a different kind of layout. We rebuilt all of the tools, the compiler, the ID, the bundlers, and so on. That's funny because I thought it was a lambda dragon, like a lambda function that became a dragon. It could be. <laughs> so the, if you look at the logo, the letters, like uh, they're colored differently. So you, you can read lambda. Those are like darker or something. We're going to go there. So what do we need to add to our languages? We need to make them more composable, easy to layer them, easy to encapsulate things. So for example, we don't have visibility control in, in something like JavaScript. And we need that. You were talking right now, Bernsey, about something like that, right? But all of these problems, you see, like you can solve them at the language level and then all of a sudden they, they vanish. But on top of that, we also need to add more leverage. One of the best ways to prevent complexity is to avoid doing work in the first place, right? So if you have good abstractions that give you leverage, then you express things at, a le at the right level. You don't have to do all the mechanics. So the Lamb Dragon is not just a new tool chain with its compiler, bundler, and so on and so forth. It's also a set of frameworks that let you build products for different platforms. So it's a whole building, everything all together. It's very ambitious, and it's, it's basically a platform where the experience is TypeScript and JavaScript, but it, it's a fundamentally different thing. You've seen some of the demos or the, the, the prototypes, right? There's a lot of crazy stuff there too. I've seen some of the demos, Chris, Chris has not. I've seen nothing. Aldo has already showed me some of this stuff, but Chris has not seen any of it. So I feel like Chris probably has some like level setting questions right now. I do. There's something I've always wondered about for some time. And I feel like this fits into it is why do we need to worry about like file system routing or page routing or I wish we could just encapsulate things into like folders that could just be interchangeable, like kind of like mini NPM repositories, just be like, okay, this service has an API, a page view and an underlying function. These are the four NPM modules it uses. And this is its version. And then you could just like glob all of these like little sections into one app at the end. And it does it all automatically. I feel like this thing has like never existed to a certain extent as like, you know, why do we have these massive apps that do all these things where really each one is a service that does one thing. And then why can't we just have a skeleton that just pulls it all together? I feel like big companies like Facebook and Google definitely do that, but tiny companies definitely don't. Yeah. Do you remember portlets and portals back in the Java days? It was kind of the same idea. It's a uh, unit of functionality and then you just like, aggregate all of them together into like a Chrome. But you're touching something interesting there. On a more abstract level, like what, what you're saying is, I feel constrained by this abstraction or this convention or this way of doing things. And I wonder if there's probably a better way. That kind of thinking like, oh, maybe there's a different way of approaching this. I don't like it. That's common. Like it happens to us all, all the time. Now, there are two ways to solve that problem. One is to actually come up with alternatives and say, okay, you have file-based routing. And then you have this new portal thing and, and you can go and build it and you can create some protocol and standardize it and 
it's going to be a lot of work, but you can do it. And then maybe you you touch it, you you find something. You you end up you know creating a huge startup, and then you you bring me in and you give me a lot of stock, and we're all happy. Uh, <laughs> but there's another way of approaching this where you say, wait, I'm, I have this idea now. I'm going to have a different idea tomorrow. And then what can I do so that I am not constrained and I can just do whatever I think I have to do in the, the moment? That might sound like a trick question, but it's actually a very simple thing to answer. What you can do is to make use of programming languages. A programming language, JavaScript, any programming languages, is a general thing. It allows you to do whatever you want. But when you have a problem that wasn't considered at the time of designing the language, what you have to do is you need to add scaffolding around the language. And now you're restrained by that scaffolding. But if you eliminate the scaffolding and you just use the language, you can actually do everything you want. That is part of what we have been trying to do. And, and you've seen this, Anthony, like the build tool, the way you express what you want to build, the way you change things together is making use of the programming language itself. Everything is code. This is really worth honing in on. And I've been talking about infrastructure as code going back to like episode nine. I kind of laid out this this whole vision, why I thought this was so important, why I've been so excited about what you've been working on, because a programming language by definition can do everything every other programming language can do. That's what makes something a programming language. If it's Turing complete, it can compute anything any other programming language can compute. So if we just accept that we're working with programming languages and we lean into that, we can create any abstraction we could possibly think of within the bounds of that programming language. And so you're creating abstractions on top of JavaScript and TypeScript. And so that's kind of what you've decided like your programming language of choices, right? Uh, yeah, for our project. So the Lamb Dragon is a new type of TypeScript toolchain that kills complexity with fire. <laughs> That's the tagline, I know. but it is TypeScript. Personally, I don't really like JavaScript. <laughs> I kind of hate it a little bit. You like Scala, right? Scala is your, your programming language of choice. Honestly, I don't really care in that sense. Like I, I jump from one thing to the next. The one I'm using now mostly is Rust, like these days. I started just porting everything to Rust, and I think they hit a pretty sweet spot. Rust is a good example. It's a good source of inspiration because Rust has a few things that we need to emulate if we want to solve the problem for the JavaScript community. The first one is that the core team took care of many of the issues at once. So Rust has testing built in, has macros built in, has great dependency management built in almost, right? But it's very cohesive. And then on top of that, you have documentation and the way you publish things is so streamlined. All of those things, they add up to eliminating complexity. So the, the complexity in a Rust code base doesn't grow as fast as it does in a, in a JS monorepo code base. And you can have in one project multiple different binaries and you can publish to different targets and you can have this idea of different configurations for building. You can have multiple dimensions and products being generated from the same code base. And when you are in that code base, you're free to think about code and not the boundaries around you. I think Rust is also giving me a reference point because many of the things that we've added to Lamb Dragon, I can say, oh, well, look at how Rust is doing it. So kind of validation, I, I like it. And Scala 3 is great, but the thing with Scala 3 is it doesn't push the limits like Rust does. So R Rust is actually giving you something new, something pretty powerful. Scala 3 is still, it's potentially going to be game changing because of the metaprogramming, but I haven't seen that yet. We haven't seen the result of the libraries that people will build with the metaprogramming facilities in Scala 3. And the other cool thing with Scala, I mean, the whole the whole Java ecosystem is Graal. Graal is, that, that's going to generate some crazy innovation, right? I think people are trying to get their head around the possibilities. None of our listeners, I think, will really know what, what Graal VM is, but I actually do, because I've listened to many podcasts about Graal VM. It's, it is quite interesting. It's a new JVM, essentially, is kind of what I've gotten out of it. It's a new JVM, which is faster, but that doesn't really matter. It, that, that's not revolutionary, but it's also a polyglot runtime engine. What that means is you can write code in multiple languages and they're going to run in the same runtime, which means that the objects, for example, are shared between your Ruby and your JavaScript and your Java. So there's no overhead there. And it's a little rough around the edges when it comes to developer experience and tooling. But that's just a matter of time. The core part, the, the hardest part is there. It, it actually, it does work. It's very performant. It also gives you a lot of possibilities when it comes to instrumentation, which is very interesting for me as a tooling developer, the kind of things you can do. Like 
coverage and you know lamb dragon has the light like the quokka inside like this how do you call it live i don't even know how, how you i call it a sandbox but uh, or a playground what is the category for those things like quokka and wallaby there is no good term for them because it's not a large enough category i think to have a term because like when you think of like playground and sandbox like it gets across the idea but those terms are also used for many other things so it's like anytime you want to just define something that's like interactive as an interactive development or something yeah interactive something i did want to quickly bring up rust recently one password is really chucking up all the uh, conversations around Apple and Mac apps. The reason why is 1Password is dumping their native apps and going Electron on all platforms with the core written in Rust. So the core is written in Rust and the Electron wrap is wrote in TypeScript. There's so much to that story. They've said that they've been using Rust in production now as the core of their apps on Linux and Windows, and now they're obviously transferring it over. What other real, like real world cases have you seen for Rust so far? Any big companies that you know that are using it with success? Why they use it? Well, I'm not an expert in that area, but I know that Cloudflare has a bunch of like Rustafarians. You have Mozilla, which created the language. So Firefox, for the most part, the CSS engine, I know for sure. And I assume more parts are built in Rust. But it wouldn't surprise me if everything ends up moving to Rust because it gives you something that no other language can give you, which is there's no memory management. It gets compiled away. And that is a huge selling factor. And then if you combine that with all this cohesiveness that I was talking about, like the fact that they figured out so much and the core team has been so responsible in the way that they evolved all of these tools together, it's a pretty powerful competitor right now. And I know that Wasm allows you to do this kind of combination where you keep your web app or your election app, but the core is written in, in, in Rust. I think we're going to see more, more and more of these cases. I've seen a bunch of talks of people talking just about that. Like, hey, we had, you know, this drawing app and then we replaced this part with Rust, compiled it down to Wasm and now it's faster. So there's a lot of movement there, but it's not a language for everyone. That's another important thing. Like, I think JavaScript and TypeScript are going to be, they are already the, the king of languages in terms of a, a adoption, right? And it will just continue growing. They're easy to learn. I've messed around with Rust myself because I've been very interested in a wide range of Rust related projects over the years. It seems like the benefits it gives you to write real serious programs is just massive, but there is more of a barrier to entry than just spinning up a really simple JavaScript thing in your browser console. So I agree with you there. There's always kind of going to be this separation I think, between like people who want to get into programming and the people who want to like go that next level to get the whole benefit they can get from a programming language. And that's where Rust comes in, but it's always gonna be kind of like a step beyond. Yeah, so Rust forces you to do more work because you have to take care of something that in the case of JavaScript is transparent to you, memory management. You never think about it in JavaScript. You create an object and you pass it around and that's it. In Rust, you have this whole dimension of lifetimes and borrowing and things that you need to keep in your mind. That is a significant overhead. It's a real overhead. It's not just get over the style and you'll move fast. No, because you have to do more work, but it's worth it, especially for tooling and for things that need to be fast, right? And we're, we're seeing this trend where everything is being rewritten in a language that compiles to native. So it started with ES build, I think kind of triggered it in the JS world, but now there are a whole bunch of projects moving there, which is kind of interesting because you have Rome raising money, having built everything in TypeScript. And now they have to rebuild it in Rust. <laughs> I think it's funny. I, I don't mean to talk down any of these projects because they are actually incredibly hard to do and the teams are super talented and all that. But I can use them as a reference point to say what I think they're doing wrong or why I think they're not going to get us out of this problem, right? So if you look at what Rome is doing, they are actually doing something valuable. If they succeed, they will give you this unified tool chain that has everything and everything works cohesively. So it's like what Rust did for Rust, <laughs> which is great, but it doesn't really tackle the problem of complexity. It can diminish it a little bit, but if you really want to fix the problem of hyper complexity, let's say that a, a project today is uh, has 10 times more complexity than a project a few years ago, or 100 times more because it's exponential. You need to then slash complexity by a factor of 10. You need to do something extreme. If you want people to continue to use full stack and serverless and all these things, you need to give them a way to collapse this. And rewriting the tool chain so that the same works you use today works slightly better and faster just doesn't do that for you and then you have other a whole other set of startups 
that are working on build tooling. They're going back, looking at Basel and, and all of its offspring, all of the lineage of Basel-like tools, right? That do build automation and distributed caching of builds and speed your builds, basically. And does NX fall into that, that category of tools? Absolutely. And Nexus, I would say, is like the incumbent there. They have great penetration in the market. They've been around for a long time. There's a lot of knowledge around the Next. It's a community. You can go and watch videos and you feel like they're holding your hand. And they are at the center, I would say. But around now, you see a lot of other companies saying, but oh, we're doing it better. We're going we're gonna to put it together and it's going to be fast. And we're going to cash and uh, blah, blah, blah. This is good because I like to actually get into like, how can someone now get involved with what you're doing lamb dragon like how can they see it how can they try it how can they how do we engage with this today go to the homepage. we are currently doing like a private beta we've been working on real projects for a while so you know i've been using this to build like the redwood extension and a few other things so i've been working on real projects with this tool we are now letting some users use the tool for their own code basis so we have like a little group of like a beta, but it's very controlled because I actually want to be able to talk to people. But we are slowly expanding this. So by the time this comes out, there's uh, going to be a form on the homepage where you can go and request a demo and then we will talk. So just so you can filter yourself out and not waste your own time, this tool is going to be focused mostly on, on highly complex code bases. If you're using NX right now, if you're looking into using, I don't know, Turbo Repo or something like that, this is an alternative to that where instead of you keeping this idea of the monorepo and keeping the complexity and just adding something to manage it on top, you can actually start eliminating this complexity. And I think at the end, this is a much more powerful option because it just makes everything faster. It's not just about build speed. Build speed shouldn't even be a thing. If you have a small code base and it's lean and the tooling is, doesn't even have to be great, it's just okay, you won't be thinking about build speed ever. It's not a thing. You think about it because you have a very complex setup. And you have builds that depend on each other and you have a lot of code that shouldn't even be there and then you have three different transpilation processes here and there so complexity is what is creating this for you right so then i'm drawing on this an alternative to patching things up and it's starting to be pretty fast too the rust version is as fast as this build we're still fighting with uh, some bugs in swc <laughs> that are very hard to manage i actually just tweeted about this yesterday peter tried to port redwood from babel to swc and here's the, the one-liner for you. Roughly 40 to 50% of all Redwood tests failed. There you go. Roughly half of all tests failed with SWC. Remember, I told you 40% of my tests were failing. Yeah, you are the carry of the coal mine. You told me this a month ago. You're like, SWC is broken. Yeah, it is. And I'm surprised that they are using it in Dino. It's a safe alternative to Node, but then the transpilation step can produce code that is not what you meant it to be. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. But uh, now they are, I think, Vercel is sponsoring or hired the developer, right? So they hired the lead maintainer of SWC. So I imagine it's going to get a lot more funding, a lot more people working on it. And so it will be hopefully a rising tide that lifts all boats there. And having a use case like Redwood, to me, is like, I've called this technical chicken, where you have a large project and a large project trying to integrate, and then you see where everything breaks, and it forces each of them to actually figure it out and like make it work. So it's just a matter of time, you know, hopefully we'll work it out. Yeah, it's a huge undertaking. Anyway, interesting code base. <laughs> it's like a Frankenstein. I'm super excited to know more about Lamb Dragon because I've heard nothing about it so far and I kind of want to see some documentation to be fair. There's a bunch of Lamb Dragon URLs that are like actually live. You just have to actually know what they are. It was like that with Astro. It's like, there's a beta, but if you know the URLs, you can just uh, look at it. Astro is cool. I like that it, it is very bold. Instead of going from the single page app and slowly crawling towards Static generation is like, let's flip it around. Let's build a framework where static generation is the thing. And then the exception is some things can be dynamic. And I think that's a very good mindset. So in Lamb Dragon, we have built-in frameworks. So the thing is that Lamb Dragon is going to be, it's going to include or like absorb many of the different things that you're doing now. So it also has its own frameworks. You don't have to use them, but they're, they're there. We have a web framework, like a single page app web framework. It's kind of easy. It's just React. But uh, with Astro, I could finally see a direction for an alternative web framework, one that is going to be focused on massive, like statically generated sites, and it integrates with everything else. So Lamb Dragon also has infrastructure, databases, ORM, and so on. It's like the whole thing. It's a lot of work. It's taken two years to even scope it out. You know, 
Yeah, no, this stuff doesn't come out of nowhere. And for any like FS Jam super fans may have heard, I've referenced you like multiple times throughout the course of this show, going all the way back to episode two with David Price. We were talking about the Redwood extension, and then we had Monica Powell on, and you worked with her a lot on the Redwood internals package. And so, like, you have been kind of a background character in so many interesting things that have been going on with these frameworks. So I usually think about this show as, like, two-way street. There's, like, me getting to reach out to people who are doing interesting things that are already public and, like, talk to them. And then the reverse is people who haven't really gone out much and talked about these things and hopefully present it to the world. So I think what you're working on is, like, so interesting. And it's going to be really great to get kind of more people involved in looking at it and seeing what's going on here. So do you have, like, a single home page that people can go to for Lamb Dragon? LambDragon.com. 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 That's a good place to be. We're also working on HyperComplexity.com. That's going to be fun. This idea of hypercomplexity, I coined the term, oh, hypercomplexity exists as a mathematical term, but it, as applied to technology, I was looking for a term that could describe what was going on. And I, I, I arrived at that one. It had this magical effect that once I started using it, people immediately get what I'm trying to say. Even you, Bernstein, you, you, you embraced it immediately, right? Now you were saying, yeah, the complexity is killing me. Once you hear it, you're like, yeah, that's happening to me. Because it's happening to us, and not just in tech, like our lives have become so complex that they're hard to manage. So how many emails do you have that you haven't even, you know, getting your head around? Like I am overwhelmed. I'm, I just, I'm done with it. I think it might become some sort of, I won't say movement, but some idea that we can work on and help guide. If you want people in the industry to work on solutions, ideally we should understand what the problem is first. And I think all of these startups, they're getting funding, they're pulling in you know, talent but they're focused on an inconsequential symptom of something. It's a waste of time. Like, why would you even rebuild a compiler like for the nth time? Why would you build a build? You have Basil, you have Pants, you have three, four different things happening already. You have an X and now you have a six and an eighth and a ninth one. And they're getting funding and they're getting buzz. And you know why they're getting funding and buzz and all that? Because they're talking about a problem that people have. It resonates with everyone, but no one can quite figure out like what is the solution. So hopefully you have the solution. I mean, if you say, are your build slow? People are like, yeah, they're so slow. Okay, I'll speed them up. Thank you. But that's not the issue. Why are they so in the first place, right? I hope that we can kind of change the focus into what we should really do. Sometimes decisions are not truly known until you've experienced the problems from them decisions. For a really good example, and I hate to be this one that brings up is Babel. You add a Babel plugin or you add two or you add three, and then you start increasing the size of your code base and the transpilation times increase and increase and increase. Say if you're using something like emotion style components, you really don't notice how much transpilation is adding until it's too late. And you're like, why is my app taking like five minutes to just get going? And then you realize, oh, you know, all these compiled styles are really slowing it down. You don't think about them things when you think, oh, I want CSS and JS. You don't think, how is this going to be performing when I have 500 files with this in? And then you're at the point of, do you go, A, how do I actually fix this and speed it back up? Or B, what can I convert it to? Back to the old post CSS? And that's just one example that even I've seen where a decision that looked like it ticked all the right boxes when the decision was made only to have it implemented into a bigger scale and, to, and see that, no, while yes, it ticked all the boxes as, yes, it allowed me to have CS in, in JS, blah, blah, blah. But actually, the developer experience was degraded so, so much. It is hard to escape that. So in, that, in this particular case, what the solution would look like is, for the general case, for the common scenarios, we consider those in the core language. We need to improve the core languages, the, the, the way modules work, the way our build tools work, all these things, we improve them so that everything that falls in the common category of things doesn't add complexity at all. It's covered, okay? That, that's step one. And that might sound abstract, but it's actually going through a list of things that people do often and making sure that the languages accommodate those. And then you have the extraordinary cases, like I wanna use uh, some preprocessor or a specific plugin. So for those cases, if they don't fit in the general mold, then what you have to include in the language is a way to isolate 
things. It's a way to allow you to draw a boundary around the thing that is strange or different and then provide a mechanism so that that fits into the bigger picture. I know this is abstract, but these are things that we know how to do. Programming language design has been evolving and understanding the benefits and strategies for modularization, for encapsulation, for composability. We also have a whole toolbox of techniques that we haven't used in the JS world, like metaprogramming, not like just preval or macros, but something that is also tightly integrated with the bundlers, with the IDE. And I showed Anthony, like, we have macros. This is actually great because like macros as a concept don't really exist in JavaScript. And there are some that if you're into things like Lisp or these other languages that where it's like a key feature, you're, you're very aware of that. But like you were showing me macros and I'm like, almost no one I know who does like JavaScript or something like that. The macros isn't even a concept that they're aware of. Yeah. The thing is that if you want to use macros, you will very quickly end up having to understand the ASTs and compilers and a whole bunch of things. So it's like pulling a thread and, and you just get this huge mountain that falls on you. But you can have some simple macros for simple cases where, you know, if you just want to get a list of files on a folder, or if you want to pre-process something, you shouldn't need to touch an AST or even deal with that. So we've done, a, we've put a lot of work into figuring out how to add some metaprogramming facilities to JavaScript that don't break anything else. So that's a nice thing about building the whole story, like all, everything from the compilers all the way to the frameworks is that you get to see how your decisions affect every level. And I think it's the only way, because if you don't, if we don't do that, then we're not pushing things forward. We're just one more little isolated innovation that then you need to piece together with something else. And that would only contribute to the problem. Cool. Well, Thank you so much, Aldo, for being here on the FSGM podcast. I've been, when I created this show in the first place, you were one of like a small number of people that I like created to get on. So I'm very happy to finally got you onto the show to talk about all these things. Like this is a really interesting episode. Thank you, Anthony. One year late, but it's definitely been worth it. You've been in secret mode as then BCs call it these days. Stealth mode what they call it, that secret mode stealth mode i'm not on the the vc brags talk <laughs> i'm not in the note but yeah it's been really great to have you on yeah i apologize for the long silence but i hope now it, it makes sense like i i really didn't want to talk about these things before i had a story that didn't contribute to the confusion you didn't want to put vaporware out into the world and that's awesome I despise vaporware with all my heart. I see how greed operates and we, the different incentives that we have in this current JS VC driven world or whatever. Um, it drives me really mad. In the end, who's going to pay the, the price for all this confusion? It's the developers that have no control, right? So as a tooling developer, I feel very responsible because I know that if I succeed, people want, are going to use my stuff and I'll have a great influence in their lives. If you ever create a program, like I, I've seen uh, some YouTube channels where they, they just roast like uh, pitch decks or things like that. <laughs> they just laugh at them and like, we should do that with startups in the JS world and projects. Like not, not in a mean way, but just to give people perspective because there's no opposing force. There's this new sh shiny thing. Everybody's tweeting, everybody's talking about it. And the people that can see the problems with it, they don't have the energy or they are not going to go and try and reach you to tell you. You want to show that the emperor has no clothes. That's what you want to do. Nobody wants to do that, but I think we need to start. Uh, the JS world is, is out of control, if you ask me, in that sense. That's a good note to end on. It's all your fault, Anthony. It's all your fault. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I look at the JS world, I can't imagine how anyone could not you know, resonate with the, the things you're talking about. So thank you so much for laying out this whole case and then attempting to build something to actually address it. I think it's, it's really exciting. And I hope that lots of people will check out Lamb Dragon. Thank you, Anthony. Hey, man, it's your own.